So today we're going to take on uh, my on again, off again sermon series called Lies My Pastor Told Me. Today's subject is biblical womanhood. Now, for those of you who are like, well, what's biblical womanhood? It is this idea often promoted by non-denominational evangelical groups, uh, though Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod Lutherans will promote it too from time to time, in which they go ahead and cherry pick a handful of women who are relatively feminine by Victorian, not Christian standards, Victorian standards, and say, look, Victorian ideals of who a woman is equals Christian ideals. And they'll do the same with men too, right? Uh, the problem with this as a sort of explanation is that the Bible has all sorts of different types of men, all sorts of different types of women, and well, some are definitely, some women are definitely feminine, some are, uh, and fit sort of that Victorian um, idea of what a woman is or what a woman should be, and again, same with man, men, um, that's not at all what you find if you actually open up the Bible, uh, because you're going to find this great variety of what it means to be female and what it means to be male all across the Bible. So let's take that on because this is a great um, reading today to begin that conversation. So let's talk about what's going on in the reading. Up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus referred himself as the Messiah for the people of Israel, um, the Lamb for the, for the Israeli people. So it's a very defined group, right? He's saying, I am here as the Messiah to save the Jews. By implication, if you're not Jewish, he's not there for you. And we see that play out at the beginning of today's text, right? This woman, who's a Gentile, comes to him and says, hey, can you heal my daughter? His initial guttural response, because remember, he sees himself as here for the people of Israel, is to come out and say, no. I am not feeding the bread meant for the children to the dogs. By implication, she's a dog. That's really not nice. Jesus fail right there. But here's the thing. She pushes back. She doesn't just do the Victorian feminine thing of, oh, okay. No, she is strong. She is mighty. She's going to tell God him, God's self, dude, that's not how this works. That is not the plan your dad has for you. So she comes back and says, now, huh, hold on. Shouldn't the dogs at least get to eat the scraps that fall from the table? And Jesus, of course, relents. He changes course. He says, you know what? You're faithful. Granted. Your daughter is healed. Now, if it just stopped there, we could sort of chalk it up as a healing story. You have a lot of healing stories where Jesus sort of pushes back at first and then relents afterwards and lets the person know that their faith has healed them. Sure, and that's where most evangelicals will try to chalk the story, but, but that's because they're missing a really important piece, or they're ignoring a really important piece of the story, which is what happens next. See, up to this point, like I had said, Jesus always referred himself as a Messiah for the people of Israel. From this point through the rest of the gospel, he'll refer to himself as a Messiah for everyone, for Jew or Gentile, slave or free, man or woman. Why? Because this woman taught Jesus. Jesus was a better Messiah because of her. So for those in the Wisconsin and Missouri synods that have a very negative view of what it means for women to be teachers, I'd pose to you and those evangelicals who would follow, though not all do. If this woman taught Jesus, why can't women teach? Why can't women lead? Why can't women preach? Because this, my friends, is by definition biblical womanhood, because it's a woman doing good in the Bible. Now, you could say, well, okay, so that, that's a one example. Maybe it's a one-off. Maybe it's a weird thing. Maybe we can debate this. I say, okay, well, fine. Let, let's keep looking. All right, so let's go to the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is full of all sorts of awesome women. So let's talk about Deborah. Okay, now if you don't know the story of Deborah, get to your Old Testament, go look it up, get your concordance out, Google it, whatever, however you like to do it, start reading. So first of all, Deborah is a prophetess turned judge, okay, and she is, which again, 
not going to fit into Victorian values, but definitely fits into Christian values, that this woman can be a judge. So she goes ahead, raises through the ranks, becomes a judge after being a prophetess, and she's helping to basically run the country. She's sort of the judicial branch, or at least a major player in the judicial branch of government, okay? So we're talking like Supreme Court justice, okay? And then what happens? Well, an invasion comes. Now, she is probably the best strategic and tactical thinker, so she goes to the general, and the general goes, I don't know what to do. We are outnumbered. They have more chariots than us. We are going to get crushed under their chariots. And she goes, calm down. You know what? Only a woman can defeat this general of this opposing army. And if any of you have ever seen, like, Remington Steele, basically what happens is he becomes the front person, she makes all the strategy, she is running that war. He is just sort of there to give a masculine tone when revving up the troops, because it's a patriarchal society. Um, and she basically leads the war. She defeats the guy, he retreats, she saves the people of Israel, but only sort of, because he's going to regroup and he's going to come back. And so she turns to her spy network, particularly a spy who, by the way, is a woman, by the name of Jael. Now, Jael goes ahead, sneaks in, in the cover of darkness, to the uh, commander of the other side. She goes ahead, and there's some controversy in the Hebrew, but m many uh, scholars think, we, we all know he ends up asleep. We don't know if she ends up drugging him or not, okay? There's some debate that's legit whether or not he just falls asleep because he's exhausted or she drugs him because she gives him a drink and then he falls asleep. Needless to say, he is so asleep that she then kills him by driving a, a uh, stake to a tent. Okay, You know those stakes you put in to keep your tent from flying away if it's a big breeze? Through his head. She literally assassinates the general, which then collapses his empire, and the people of Israel are saved. Which means that biblical womanhood can also look like being a military general. Biblical womanhood can look like being a member of the CIA or NSA or, an, or anything like that, because that's what Jael basically is. She is an operative. That that is also biblical womanhood. Now, you say, okay, well, that, that's one more story. Okay, then let's talk about Rahab. So Rahab's not Israeli, or not, not I'm sorry, not an Israelite. Uh, she is a madam, and she's running a spy network and, you know, sort of a businesswoman that can get you whatever you need near Jericho and inside of Jericho. And the people of Isra or the Israelite army besieges Jericho, and they go to her, and they're like, we need help. We don't know the enemy forces. We don't have any intelligence on uh, what's going on in there, and she strikes a deal and says, I can get you all that, uh, but when you invade, don't burn my stuff to the ground. Because she's both a spy and a businesswoman and a smuggler and goodness knows what else. She's honestly not the most savory of characters. And she helps take down Jericho. She helps defeat this big stumbling block that would have kept the people out of the promised land. And she's a woman, and she's in, she's in the Bible. So that's biblical womanhood. Now some of you would say, well now hold on, isn't it okay to be feminine and be female? Absolutely it's okay, and you can run through a whole slew of folks, like the evangelicals will, and, and, and do rightfully, of women who are very feminine. The thing is, the lie is not that there are feminine women in the Bible, there are. But there's a huge breadth of different types of women doing different types of things, being different types of leaders all throughout the Bible. And what the Bible tells us, and this is true, by the way, of masculinity and men. We could have an entire different sermon on, you know, lies my pastor told me masculinity. The reality is that yes, you can find homemakers, you can find mothers, and that should be celebrated, and homemakers and mothers should be celebrated, but so should generals and spies and all these other things that we see women do, and teachers and judges and these sorts of things that you find throughout the Bible should be just as equally celebrated. Because the real story, the real truth of biblical womanhood, is the same truth of biblical manhood is that what it means to be a woman or to be a man in the Bible is to follow God. 
to go where God leads you, to sacrifice and to work and to praise God in whatever adventure God leads you on, which honestly isn't based off your gender. It's based off of God's plan for you and God's will for you and your gifts and your skills, which has nothing really to do with whether or not you're male or female. So as you go out today, I want you to remember that no matter who you are, God loves you. No matter who you are, God wants you to go inside and figure out where God is leading you. And don't limit yourself by the Victorian values of an age only a hundred or so years ago. Because our Christian values reminds you you can be whoever God calls you to be. Amen.